Let me get rolling here on this series that we've been in, this journey to freedom. And, you know, one of the things that we've discussed is in this journey, there's some roadblocks the devil, the enemy tries to throw out there. And, uh, you know, for you to break through into the freedom God has for you, some of these roadblocks, they just have to be blown through. Amen? And I recently read this story. This actually happened some time ago, but I just recently read about it, about a high-rise hotel that was being uh, built in Texas along the Gulf Coast there. And um, what they did, they actually sank pylons deep into the, deep into the earth there, into the water, and this hotel was actually out over the water. Pretty cool, huh? And as they were getting ready for grand opening, uh, somebody thought, hey, wait a minute. What, what about people? They're going to want to open the windows, and they're going to want to fish out the hotel. And so they thought, okay, we better put up signs in the room. So they did. No fishing uh, out the windows of the hotel. Of course, that didn't work. It was a disaster. I mean, can you imagine people are down in the dining room and they're enjoying their meal and all of a sudden here's a fish slapping against the glass as it's being reeled up to the fifth floor or whatever. And they thought, well, what do we do? Well, uh, the manager had a good idea. He said, I got an idea. What do you say we take the signs down? Because nobody checks into a hotel thinking, hey, I'm going to go fishing out the window here. And so they did. That took care of the problem. What they discovered was the rule itself is what was inciting the desire to break the rule. Think about that for a moment. Now, how many of you know churches, or or let me say it this way, religion can be really good at putting all kinds of crazy rules out there, right? Like who said you have to wear a suit and tie? Who said that? Show me the verse, chapter, verse, book. Where does it say you have to dress like that? be able to come and worship the Lord or stained glass windows you know the church I grew up in um, you know they asked me to be an usher and I thought well that's cool and so I went and I ushered uh, you know the next week and uh, the pastor pulled me aside and he said hey we can't have you usher unless you're going to wear a tie and I went I wasn't trying to be rebellious but the only ties I had were clip-on ties And those are pretty stupid-looking ties. I didn't want to wear one of those. So needless to say, they didn't let me be uh, be an usher after that. Now, let me talk with you about a group of people in the Bible who were really classic at creating all kinds of rules that were never in the Bible. They were the Pharisees. They were the Pharisees. They were classic at coming up with all kinds of rules that were never mentioned in the Bible. Now, legalism is all about a system of control. But how many of you know this to be true? You cannot legislate morality. You cannot control people into being righteous. That is a work of the heart. It's not a work of control. You know, I was reading recently about the Berlin Wall, which was a system of control. It was to control external behavior. As far as the leaders of that country were concerned, hey, as long as you guys operate within this wall and you do what we want you to do, we're going to be happy with you. But on the other end, there's a Brandenburg Gate. A gate is a symbol of liberty. And, you know, has God called us to be a wall or has he called us to be a gate? Tell me about Scripture. Does it refer to Jesus as being a wall or of being a gate? A wall is a system of control, but a gate is an invitation to walk through a passageway into liberty, into freedom. And so the question is this, are you a gate or are you more like a wall? Which one are you more like? Now, let's continue to talk about this. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus uses two stories there. There's two stories that take place. Uh, The first one is this. The disciples, uh, they're walking through a grain field on the Sabbath. And they get a little hungry, and so they pick some of the grain, uh, some of the kernels of grain, and they eat it. And this throws the Pharisees 
you know, throws them a curveball. They're, they're livid. And they're like, you know, how can you possibly be who you think you are when you're breaking the law? I mean, the law says you shall not work on the Sabbath. And look what you're doing here. You're picking grain and you're eating it. And then the second one, same chapter, is Jesus goes into the synagogue, into church, on a Sunday morning. And there's a man there with a shriveled hand. And Jesus healed him. Now, how many of you think if Jesus healed somebody, that would be great cause of celebration, right? Wouldn't you all be saying, praise the Lord, hallelujah. But instead, these legalists, they're livid. How dare you be performing a miracle? You worked a miracle, and you shouldn't be doing work on the Sabbath. And so they got hung up on these details that prevented them from being able to recognize Christ for who he really was. They'd built the wall so thick and so tall that they couldn't see Jesus for being the liberator that he was called to be. I want you to imagine being in the presence of Christ and seeing him perform these miracles, and rather than recognizing him as Lord and it leading you into a place of worship, you actually begin to recognize him as a threat that needs to be eliminated. So I want to talk with you this morning about breaking down that wall of legalism. Now, I'm not talking about this so that you can recognize legalism in everybody else, right? I'm talking about it so the mirror could be turned into your own life, so that it could be turned into my life, so that we could recognize these areas where we try to control the situation. You guys remember Jeff Foxworthy? And you say, you might be a redneck if, and I wish I had a good redneck joke, but I don't. But, uh, but I do have a good Jeff, what's that? <laughs> You're relieved. <laughs> I do have a good redneck uh, impersonation, good, you know, voice. And so go ahead and grab your outline. You might be a legalist if or when. You might be a legalist when your man-made rules are more important than biblical teaching. Now, did the Bible say you can't pick grain? and eat it on the Sabbath. It did not say that. What did it say? It said, honor the Sabbath day, keep it holy. He said, for six days you shall work. On the seventh day, that is the Sabbath under the Lord, and you shall do no work. Now, the legalists, they took that, and they started piling stuff on top of it. How many of you know there's a big difference between picking a head of grain and eating it and harvesting a field? There's a world of difference between those two. And what happened here is they were so busy trying to cram their interpretation of what that law meant that they'd completely lost compassion for people and their heart of worship, which, by the way, can I say the heart behind the Sabbath law was really a call to worship. It was like a date day. You know, every week, it's our day. And rather than them having their day with the Lord, they were walking all around, you know, trying to enforce their interpretation of what that meant. And it ended up completely robbing them of their heart of worship and having any compassion for other people. Now, Jesus corrected their legalism by doing what? By pointing to Scripture. Let's take a look at what he says here. He points here in Matthew 12. He says, haven't you read that when David, what David did when he and his companions were hungry? They entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priest. You remember the story. David's running for his life. King Saul's breathing down his neck. And David and his men, they're famished. So where do they run into? They run into the church. They run into church. And I love the fact that here was a priest that recognized that compassion in action, love being demonstrated. Here are some famished men that need to be fed. And they, he was willing to do that. He saw feeding the hungry as being more important 
them following a ritual. That's important for us to understand. Amen? I've heard of all kinds of uh, stories. And I'm not going to go into all of them. But maybe you've been in these situations where, uh, where you weren't allowed into a, a church or you weren't allowed into a place of worship because you weren't dressed in the way they think you should have been dressed. Maybe you weren't wearing the coat and tie. And you came in dressed like you are, and it's like, sorry, that's not going to work here. Or I think of a more personal story for us, for Freedom Foursquare. You know, that's awesome that we have that uh, hot tub right there where we can baptize people. You know, for years, we've just baptized them at the family fun day. You know, sometimes it was in the river when we were at, at the river. Other times it was in a pool if we had a pool at our resources. And that was cool. How many of you were baptized in, in one of the pools or at the river when we did that one of those times? Raise your hands up high. Okay, awesome. Man, give these people a hand for that. Cool. Well, I've had people pull me aside afterwards and say, Pastor, I do not think it was appropriate for that girl to be baptized wearing that bikini. Now, let me say this. Would it be better if she had a shirt on? Probably. Okay. Kind of cover up a little bit. But the fact was, they were so hung up on this person is not wearing what they thought she should be wearing. And rather than sitting there and celebrating this young person's decision to follow Christ, they stood there like this. Shouldn't be like that. I'm telling you, that's what legalism will do to you. It will turn you into a critic. It will rob your worship. It will blind you from being able to recognize Jesus as the great liberator. You will think he's come to build a wall when, in fact, he came to knock them down. Hallelujah. Amen. You might be a legalist if your man-made rules are more important than people. No healing on the Sabbath? Where did they come up with this idea? Their rule mattered to them more than this life's man, this, this man's life being back together. Their rule mattered more to them than this man's life being made better. And Jesus puts a quite he tells them, he says, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? It's what's the rhetorical answer to that? Yes, of course you will. So why would the legalist do that? If the legalist or the Pharisee's sheep falls into the pit on a Sabbath, they certainly would take it out. Why? They see the value. They care for that sheep. And then Jesus says something so radical. He says, how much more valuable is this man than a sheep? Therefore, it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. He is saying, look, you are missing the point. People matter. People matter. And we need to do what we can do to reach people. Don't let your man-made rules become more important than meeting people's needs. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord applause for that. You might be illegalness when arguing is more important than ministry. Have you ever met Christians? They like to argue. I'm not saying you do. Have you ever met a Christian that likes to argue? Is anybody here that Christian? Exactly. Ask the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit. Because remember, I'm not talking about this so we can identify the legalism in everybody else. Good, Pastor, you tell them. I've been trying to tell them for years. Look in the mirror. So, 
when arguing is more important than ministry. So going on from that place, he went into the church. He went into the synagogue. And there was a man with a shriveled hand was there. Look what it says, you guys. Would you read the underline with me? Looking for a reason. When you're looking for a reason, what are you looking for? You're looking for a fight. You're looking for an argument. Looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. They asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? It's fascinating to me that they didn't care about the fact that this man's life was being touched by the power of God. They don't even give him any regard for that because they, they were so caught up. They just wanted to start a fight. Legalists love to argue. It's usually because it conceals the fact that they're not actually doing anything constructive to build the kingdom of God. And so to make it look like they're busy, they just argue with everybody about everything that's out there. So they're looking for a reason. Uh, they didn't care. Now, so Jesus heals the man on the Sabbath. And look what it says in Matthew. It says, then the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. This is crazy. Because what what do the legalists or the Pharisees want to do? What is their goal? Control. They want to obey the law to the nth degree. And if the law isn't enough, which, by the way, let me say this. The law was never intended to be a wall. The law wasn't intended to be a gate that would lead us towards the great liberator. But these guys took what some would perceive to be a wall, and they just made it higher, and they made it thicker. And what ends up happening here is their goal is to obey the law to the nth degree. Now, what's one of the laws say? Thou shalt not kill. And you think, wait a minute. Aren't you guys the ones all hung up on obeying the law? And so now, because Jesus healed somebody and you think he's breaking the law, you're going to really break it (laughs) and plot to kill him. That's crazy. That's nuts. Legalists seem to be more concerned about everybody else's sin than their own. And I think often we just kind of need to turn the light and allow the Holy Spirit to help search what's going on in our own heart. So I want to talk with you a little bit about how to get rid of it, how to get rid of legalism. And I think this church, generally speaking, really does a great job. And when I say this church, I'm not talking about an institution. I'm talking about you. I think you, as our church, does a pretty very good job with these three things. Go ahead and fill in the blank. Abide in Christ, be a servant, and offer hope. Let me hear you say that. Abide in Christ, be a servant, and offer hope. So you do not remove sin from your life or anybody else's by building a wall. Jesus said, remain in me. What does that mean to remain in Christ? What's this word? Abide. Abide means to remain. It's like the fruit that's attached to the vine of a tree. How does that tree, how how is that tree going to produce fruit? By by the branches staying, abiding to the trunk. Okay? How is that fruit going to be produced? By abiding, staying connected to the branch. What happens as soon as you pluck that thing off? What does it start to do? It starts to die. And what it's saying is for you, you abide in me. You remain in me. Remain in my love. Remain in my grace. Remain in my mercy. Remain in me. Bask in that. And as you do that, pretty soon sin that was so attractive to you will begin to lose its luster because your heart has been fully captured by me and my love. You're going to fail at sin management by building walls. If, however, rather than trying to manage sin, you take another path, and instead you walk through the gate, you walk through the life of the great liberator, 
Jesus Christ. You walk through him. He's going to set you free from the power of sin and death. Listen, the behavior that we act upon is the result of what's in our heart. And you cannot change a heart by building walls. The Pharisees hopefully figured that one out. I don't know if they ever did. But the fact is, you don't change a heart by a system of control. You change a heart by passing through the gate of the great liberator and abiding in his love, in his grace, and in his power. And then we learn from him. The Bible says that he came to serve. So be a servant. Jesus came to be a servant. And one of the greatest ways you're going to avoid legalism is by serving. Because you are so caught up in caring for the people that are in front of you, you're not going to have time to sit there judging them about how off track they are. And lastly, offer hope. It says in Matthew that in his name, the nations will put their what? Their hope. Their hope. Is there any hope inside the wall? There's no hope there. And so the hope is the fact that we can tell people, look, there's a way out. Jesus Christ came to not just put a gate in the wall, but to knock it down. He's come to set you free. He's come to invite you into a relationship that will change you, just like this song that we sang from the inside out. Legalism says this, that if you don't meet up to our standard, we won't accept you. Jesus says, even if you fail, I won't abandon you. I will keep reaching out to you. I will keep loving you. I will keep lifting you up. I will give you a chance again and again and again. I will keep forgiving you. Isn't it awesome that we serve a God like that? Let's give him applause for that. There's no hope behind the Berlin Wall, but Jesus says, I'm the gate that you can pass through. Now, in this passage that we looked at, Jesus contrasts the difference between the legalist, the Pharisee, and, how, and Jesus. And, their, and the main difference there is how they treat people. The legalist treated people with contempt, with disregard. They were oblivious to their suffering. But on the other hand, Jesus saw the value of people. He treated them with compassion and mercy. You know how you're going to avoid legalism in your life? It's by doing what Jesus did. Amen? It's by doing what Jesus did. Now, I want to wrap up with kind of a humorous story uh, about a lady named Margaret and her uh, cherished Yorkshire terrier named Patches. And every day at the same time, there was this ritual, kind of like this battle royale that would happen. Every day, every 24 hours, same time, Margaret would go to the cupboard there in the pantry and get a, a, a bottle, a large bottle of castor oil. And uh, that would cause Patch's ears to kind of go. Then she'd go to the kitchen and open the drawer. And when Patches heard the silverware shuffle, that was cue to beat it. Run. And so Patches was run. I mean, she'd hide under the bed. Patches would hide in the bathtub, behind the rocker, anywhere she could get to get away from Margaret and the castor oil and the spoon. But every day she'd track that dog down and hold it and force its jaws open and stuff a spoon of castor oil down its throat because someone had told Margaret, look, if you give your dog this castor oil every day, it's going to make her teeth stronger. It's going to make her live longer. It's going to make her coat, you know, so nice. And so Margaret, every day, they would have this battle, battle royale. And uh, till this one particular day, she's wrestling the dog, and the dog's squirming and whimpering. And somehow, this Yorkshire Terrier was a able to do a sideways kick and kick that castor oil right out of her hand, right onto the kitchen floor as it poured out right there. Momentary victory for the Yorkshire. Yes. And so Margaret, she goes to the pantry to get a, a, a towel to clean up the mess. 
And when she comes back, to her surprise, there's her dog licking up the castor oil right off the floor with the look of content, like she's enjoying this. And then it dawned on Margaret for a moment, wait a minute, she really did like the castor oil. She just didn't like having it crammed down her throat. There's a point that I'm making here. Is legalism is to say, you need Jesus, and the way you're going to get him is I'm going to cram him down your throat. It don't work that way. Paul said something so radical. He said, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. If you said yes to Christ, his righteousness is in you. His love is in you. His power is in you. So rather rather than trying to control people into righteousness, how about you begin to just pour out your life so that they can actually taste and see that the Lord is good? Because you might just discover this thing that they're fighting against is really just because they don't like having it crammed down their throat. But if they just simply have an opportunity to taste through an honest representation of Christ in your life, you might find out they love it. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to ask if we could bow our heads together. And this morning as I preach, as I talk, your heart's being moved. Not because we're saying, sign up for this rigid code. But you're saying, wait a minute. I've not heard the message preached quite like this where God loves me and he'll take me where I'm at, and then he'll begin the transforming process. It's not get your life all cleaned up and then God will accept you. It's come to him just as you are and let him begin his work in you. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if you've never asked Christ into your life, I want to give you an opportunity. Maybe you have at some point. But today it's time to rededicate yourself to him. If that's you, would you throw your hand in the air where you're at? If you want to commit or recommit to the Lord, amen. Amen. I see your hand. Is is there anybody else this morning? I see yours right there. Hallelujah. Can we pray this prayer together? Dear Lord, you are the good Father. You are gracious and kind. And I recognize did on the cross was for me. You paid for my sin. I received that. I receive you. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. And help me live for you. In Jesus' name. Can we stand? I want to pray for all of us collectively now. Lord, this message is not about everybody else. This is about turning the light on my own life. How do I treat people? Am I more like a wall? Am I more like a gate? Because if I'm truly going to be an imitator of Christ, you were the gate. You led people out of bondage into freedom. And, Lord, the worship that results from the revelation of that had transforming effect in people's lives. Let that revelation change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen.